Hello, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are live. So you can come join us if you want. If not, that's cool. Just leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK and all around the world. Because we taking a trip today. But hold on. If you missed our live and you want to get any highlights, you can just go to Twitch and watch the live over again or, you know what I'm saying, Patreon Monday through Friday. And we also got merch, got mine on. Uh, we're going to Sweden, though. This is a question that I've always had. How did one of the safest countries on Earth develop a huge gang problem? And I hate to say this. <laughs> ah, this, is what I want to, this is one of the rare times that I'm going to contribute music to it. Music had to be some of the reason. Music has to be some of the reasons that, that Sweden developed a gang problem. I love Sweden. R.I.P. and near. But I didn't know y'all for no I knew y'all for, for for grassy plains, a field, you know what I'm saying? Sheep. Nice looking women. I ain't know nothing. But let's get into it. Talk to me. Who is this by? Hold on. Wait, first of all, this is by World Graphics, okay. Salute, Gango. Just a few short years ago, the word Sweden brought to mind positive stereotypes, stuff like flat pack furniture, ABBA, and enlightened social democracy. From afar, the country seemed a quiet paradise, the sort of place where crime was low and people really might keep their doors unlocked at night. Of course, the reality was always a bit more complicated than that. Biker gangs and far-right thugs were active, and the police were so laid back they once failed to solve the assassination of their own prime minister. By and large, though, Sweden was seen as calm and safe. But note the key word in that sentence, was. Because today the word Sweden brings to mind not positive connotations, but relentlessly grim ones. So no, no, no. It still brings to mind positive connotations. To America, at least, but maybe not out there. But like, Americans still think Sweden is exactly that sweet. But talk to us. Stuff like firearm homicides, grenade attacks, and staggering levels of gang violence. Stuff like 13 year old killers and houses destroyed in bomb blasts. Stuff that, in 2023, is threatening to tear this once placid nation apart. With gang warfare so out of control that the military has been called in, it now feels like a good time to ask, how did this happen? How did the land of Ikea oh, and Chicago. meatballs become Europe's gun murder capital? And more importantly, can things ever go back to how they were before? Are you working hard to support your family, but never getting out? Now, the first thing to know when talking about gun and gang violence in Sweden is that it's still far below American levels. If you're watching this from a typical US big city, just know that you are way more likely to get shot dead within a few miles of home than you are visiting <laughs> Stockholm or Gotham. Hey, chill. You're right, though. That's why I keep a Glock very close to me. Continue. Okay. That said, by European standards, Sweden's firearm crime rate is crazy high. Across 2022, this Nordic country of 10.4 million recorded 391 shootings, resulting in over 60 deaths. Per capita, that ranks Sweden as the joint worst EU nation for firearms murders alongside Croatia. But it's only when you start to compare... Croatia? Croatia be having a blitz? Sweden and its cities to peer nations that it becomes clear just how bad things really are. In the same year that over 60 people died in Sweden from gunshot wounds, the combined total for Norway, Finland, and Denmark was just 10. In the capital of Stockholm, the per capita gun murder rate is almost 30 times higher than that of London. As The Economist wrote, summing up the findings in a 2018 wow. study, a man aged 15 to 29 in Sweden is 10 times more likely to get shot than in Germany. Again, if you're watching this. But you see, in Sweden, like, I can bring the blicks. The blicks can be outside. You know, I feel like they can. In London, they can't. But, like, Sweden, maybe. While sat in a large U.S. city or in certain nations in Latin America, you might now be thinking along the lines of pff, 60 gun murders in one year. Please. 
The difference is that gun homicides are relatively- You know, it's funny that you say that, sir. I'm from the city of Chicago, so to me that does sound light, but I've been doing this for a long time, and I know that it's not light for Europe. Salute to that Glock right there laying on that table like that. Continue. rare across the whole EU and used to be almost unthinkable in Sweden. In 2003, the nation had one of the world's lowest gun murder rates. As recently as 2012, it could be listed as one of the planet's 10 safest countries. It's now dropped to nearly 30th place. Just before we continue with today's video, I do want to show big range of quality in the out plus we eat ice very bright. So don't worry, though. Personal life will never discreet trial extract the Graphics you can worth for to a survey across most of the rest oh, of Europe. Yeah. <laughs> Council for Crime Prevention. This video and now back to it. According to a survey done by Sweden's National Council for Crime Prevention, while shooting deaths in their nation have been spiking across most of the rest of Europe, they've been falling. Clearly, modern day Sweden is an outlier, both on the European continent and within the continent. Should look beautiful. Look at this. What's them yellow? Them trees, the yellow things. Context of its own post-war history. The obvious question then is why? Why does Sweden in 2023 feel like a real life Scandinavian remake of Escape from New York? One answer is that it's a nation currently awash with guns. Thanks to 3,218 kilometers of coastline that's utterly empty and unguarded for vast stretches, smuggling weapons into Sweden is easy. According to police estimates, Stockholm alone contains over 3,000 illegal guns. As Vice News notes, that's around three times the number thought to be in London, a city with around 10 times the population. The majority of these guns come from the Balkans, where weapons left over from the 1990s conflicts are still readily available. Although they're being brought to Sweden for use by criminals from former Yugoslavia, at least not exclusively, rather these imported guns are being sold to a dizzying array of gangs. The exact number of gang members in Sweden is hard to determine, and estimates vary wildly. Police chief Anders Thornberg has publicly estimated about 13,000, while the government has claimed it's more in the region of 30,000. One reason it's hard to be sure is that many of the gangs are so small, even their members probably wouldn't consider themselves part of an organized crime group. Speaking of ICE, crime reporter Kim Malmgren explained, Most of them wouldn't recognize themselves as an organization, but more as a group of friends who grew up together. But while it's hard to class... So a click. They don't recognize themselves as members. They just a click. Click of homies, you know what I'm saying, moving, making money with each other. Specify the exact number of gangs in Sweden, their effect on society can be seen all too easily. Back in September, a single 12-hour period saw a teenage rapper slaughtered outside a football pitch as children were playing, a grown man shot dead, and a young woman killed in Uppsala when her house was destroyed by a bomb erroneously left at the wrong address. All told, September was the worst month for homicide in Sweden in four years, with 2023 already on track to exceed 2022 in the number of shootings and bombings. It was against this dark background that Prime Minister Ulf Christensen made a rare televised address, an address in which he told the nervous public that, quote, Sweden has never before seen anything like this. No other country in Europe is seeing anything like this. An address in which he also pledged to call in the army to help stop the bloodshed. Whether it will work is another matter. With police chiefs briefing that this is Sweden's worst security crisis since the Second World War, it seems naive to think that it could be quickly solved. Rather, the current situ Very naive. situation is a result of decades of accidents and missteps that have finally added up to a national catastrophe. Blood on the tracks. I don't blame you, sir. If you ever need a real-life example of the law of unintended consequences, look no further than what happened in Sweden in 2020. That year, as most of the world was trapped indoors by the pandemic, European police were quietly at work breaking the codes of EncroChat, a communications network favored by organized crime. The result was a wave of arrests across the continent. Thousands of gangsters who talked freely on the surface about smuggling drugs or ordering a hit were thrown behind bars. In Sweden alone, 400 criminals went down, including the heads of multiple gangs. At the time, it felt like a massive win for law enforcement, a killer blow that had chopped the head off countless crime family. Yeah, you would think so. But the thing about that is when people go to jail all at once, they talk, they talk, they click up, they grow. So we'll see how this plays. It's, it's only in retrospect that breaking EncroChat's codes seems like a dangerous mistake. Speaking to The Independent, Swedish journalist Darm and Sully, who described how, quote, 
The arrests led to chaos, where very young gang members are now fighting for dominance of the lucrative drugs market. One of the key words in that sentence is young. With the old yeah, there was probably a power vacuum. generation of crime bosses gone, Sweden seems to have become a playground for children acting out their gangster fantasies. The only difference being that these games have deadly consequences. A 2021 Swedish police report into young gang members found a low threshold for lethal violence, as well as, quote, lack of respect for human life and the indifference to the risk of harm to third parties. You can see how this translates into real-world harm just by looking at some of the recent stories to come out of the country. In 2023, a 13-year-old was shot in the head execution-style in a Stockholm suburb. Back in 2020, two teenagers were tortured and raped in a cemetery as a form of punishment. Often, these brutal crimes aren't even committed for money or control of lucrative drugs routes. They're more linked to teenage obsessions, issues of respect or of showing dominance. It didn't used to be like this. While Sweden has always had gangs, they tended to be structured more like traditional cartels, biker gangs, or crime empires linked to the Middle East with strict hierarchies and bosses controlling everything. This is the model you'll still find in other European countries like Germany, the Netherlands, or Belgium. To be clear, it's not a model that we want to romanticize. Belgium is going through its own crisis of gang violence linked to transnational cocaine cartels, and anyone who thinks such cartels can't be brutal has, well, obviously never watched Narcos. In the Swedish context, though, the old bosses at least tried to avoid civilian casualties, knowing that it would harm business. The young new yeah, casualties always harm business. Once there's an M around, there's more police around, and they're investigating and things that are becoming uncovered that don't want to be uncovered. Upstarts, by contrast, have developed a habit of trying to kill family members of anyone they have beef with. This has led to multiple innocent people being shot or blown up in cases of mistaken identity, a cycle of violence fueled by having so many small gangs competing for finite resources. Police in Stockholm alone have counted 52 such organizations. Police chief and head of intelligence for the greater Stockholm area, Jail Poljarevius, has even gone on record saying the current crisis is more like low-intensity warfare than a crime problem, a perception undoubtedly fueled by the authorities' failings. The Economist reports that only around 20% of Sweden's gang-related murders are ever solved, nor are the police often able to react in real time. Back in 2020, Gothenburg was paralyzed. Not surprised, police are being slow, okay by a gang war so intense it saw rival organizations setting up roadblocks and ambushes to capture their enemies. Although the police intervened to dismantle the roadblocks, they didn't arrest anyone. The violence only ended when the gangs themselves agreed a truce. If that sounds unbelievable, rest assured that you've not heard the half of it. It's time for a quick dive into one of the major causes driving Sweden's gang wars, the legal roadblocks stopping the government. You know who he remind me of? What kind of sound like? What's the dude from the UK that be doing all the, um... The ones, like, he used to do, he did the King Von documentary that was like three hours. What was his name again? I forgot. Of him from doing anything about it. What if I told you for... I'll call you a liar. Young Guns. As we just mentioned, one of the unique features of Sweden's gang problem is that many of those carrying out shootings and bombings are extremely young. Like, not even in the sense of 18-year-olds with little life experience. We mean kids between the ages of 13 and 15. Speaking to the Telegraph, Swedish police acknowledged the existence of around 1,200 so-called... Man, that's crazy. It's like they modeling their gang stuff after Chicago. The current state of gang stuff after Chicago's current state of gang stuff. Child soldiers. The children are also said to make up the majority of those arrested for gangland offences. This is where things start to get really problematic. In Sweden, the age of criminal responsibility is 15. Anyone who commits a crime below that age cannot be sentenced to any punishment. This contrasts with nations like England, which set the criminal responsibility age at 10. But Sweden goes even further. The recent law. It's 10 in the UK? In England? I didn't know that. Court agreed that those under 18 should only be arrested as a last resort, while those under 21 should only be imprisoned in exceptional circumstances. The goal of these legal changes, carried out last decade, was to improve the rights of offenders and make it easier to rehabilitate young criminals. As an idea, it's definitely laudable, an attempt to remove the lifelong stigma that petty t Okay, where did they get this clip from? She got a full face of makeup, full set of nails, hair done. Teenage crimes can carry in places like America or the UK. Sadly, that attempt at enlightened policy has now hamstrung the police dealing with vicious teenage gangs, and those remaining gangs still run by older men have been incentivized to recruit kids. As appalling as that last sentence was, there's a cold logic behind it. 
Consider the case of a 16-year-old hitman who walked into a Stockholm gym last year intending to kill a much older gang member only to shoot dead an innocent bystander. Under Sweden's lenient system, the teenage murderer was sentenced to less than three years in a youth care home. Even other Scandinavian countries disagree with this approach. When Swedish gang members, all under the age of 18, crossed into Denmark to carry out a hit, the Danish authorities locked them up for 20 years. As centre-right MP Johan Forsell pointed out to The Economist, if they committed the same murder in Sweden, the maximum penalty oh, would have been four years in a social institution. For gangs, there are other advantages to using... years and two years i don't even think that's a i think like you get locked up if you if you hear and you do something at 13 you, you're gone you're going to a, a prison until at least until you're 18 you still getting some you still getting seven seven years at a young offenders prison or something right children. Homemade bombs inside thermos flasks look less suspicious when carried by a kid. Such kids are also easier to manipulate. Really, though, it's the justice system's inability to convict young offenders that's driving the trend. As former chief prosecutor Lise Tam complained to The Telegraph, we protect the integrity of criminals and ignore the victims. A statement that's hard to argue with when you realize that, until very recently, Swedish police weren't even allowed to tap criminals' phones. Still, the current problems aren't solely a byproduct of a two that's hard to argue with when you realize that until very recently, Swedish police weren't even allowed to tap criminals' phones. Oh man, you was out ace. Hey, they was out there being able to do whatever they wanted to. I know some of the more established members and organizations are upset at these young kids for ruining it because it, it, it's gonna get that. It's gonna, slowly but surely. They gon' tighten up. Still, the current problems aren't solely a byproduct of an extremely lenient legal system. Despite a 75% increase in budget in recent years, Sweden police forces are still comparatively That's underfunded good. and undermanned. As recently as 2020, the country could boast only two police officers per thousand residents compared to three in Germany. Within the EU, only Denmark, Finland, and Latvia have fewer police officers per capita. Admittedly, these figures are now slightly out of date. Sweden has been on a police hiring spree not yet visible in Eurostat data, with the goal of adding 6,000 new frontline officers by by 2024. But even this increase is below where police chiefs wanted to be. The chief of the Gothenburg This is a very well done, you know what I'm saying? Police has asked for 10,000 more cops to be added. So yeah, it's fair to say that the entire legal apparatus in Sweden is facing challenges. Challenges well that have helped you. fuel the escalating crisis. Even so, we still haven't answered our title question. How did things get so bad? Okay, here we go. This is my prediction. To do that, we're going to have to turn our attention to another key ingredient in the nation's combustible mix. An ingredient that many Swedes find too controversial to even talk about. A failed set of immigration policies. Now, the trouble with discussing immigration and crime is that it can effectively sweep away all nuance, reducing what is an extremely complicated topic into just another front in the never-ending culture wars. However, it's also a topic that we need to at least try and broach. According to The Economist, some 50% of Sweden's gang members were born abroad. Even those born in Sweden are highly likely to have parents who weren't. 85% of those involved with gangs have what the magazine termed an immigrant background. In most cases, that means Iraqi, Somali, Lebanese, Turkish, Syrian, or Balkan heritage. For some on the right, this is as far as the discussion needs to go, further proof that immigrants are inherently criminal. Yet, to stop here it would be to ignore the fact that this is unique to Sweden. As the Telegraph, hardly a bastion of lefty wokeness, has written, Yes, the 2015 asylum wave saw Sweden import all kinds of criminality among the record numbers of people it took in. But Germany took in even more and doesn't have such problems. So what then is it about the Swedish immigration system that has led to so many young men with foreign backgrounds turning to organized crime? At least a partial answer comes from the last two prime ministers. According to Sweden's current centre-right leader, Ulf Christensen, quote, it is an irresponsible immigration policy and a failed integration that has brought us here. Before Liz Bauer in 2022, his centre-left predecessor, Magdalena Andersson, had meanwhile declared that we now have parallel societies in Sweden. We live in the same country, but in completely different realities. It's in those two quotes 
that we can begin to get a sense of the true root problem. An absolute failure to ensure peoples of wildly different cultures have any means or incentive to integrate. And the issue is tied up in housing, or perhaps more accurately, housing and a lack of forward planning. For such a small nation, Sweden is stupid. I feel like that's always the reason. Dependently diverse. While its population is roughly similar to that of the Czech Republic, the 2021 census found that fewer than 5% of Czech residents were born abroad. In Sweden, that number is more like 20%. While its population is roughly similar to that of the Czech Republic, the 2021 census found that fewer than 5% of Czech residents were born abroad, like this guy. In Sweden, that number's closer to 20%. Much of this has been fueled by Sweden's self-image as a humanitarian superpower, a place not afraid to take in those fleeing conflict or persecution. Trap Loras, who remind me of Trap Loras, the way he's... Oh. The way he's uh, narrating it. Between 2012 and 2022, the number of foreign born residents rose by 680,000, in large part driven by refugees. Unfortunately, Sweden's welcome often doesn't extend much beyond opening the door. Swedish crime reporter Darman Sala, who himself born in Kosovo, has described how the only housing often available to migrants is in suburbs far from cities where, quote, the schools are poor, there is high unemployment, and many do not speak Swedish. An approach, he said, makes people outsiders. A typical example of this might be Husby outside Stockholm. There, 80% of the population of immigrant backgrounds, mostly Iraqi, Somali, Syrian, and Turkish. So deprived is Husby that the government classes it as one of 22 extremely vulnerable areas. But as Salihu has said, poverty isn't the only problem or even the main one. Rather, it's a combination of factors that leave residents untethered from wider society. Harsh labor laws, for example, mean it can be near impossible for newcomers to find legal work. That's created a gap in unemployment rates between natives and non-natives that's the worst in the developed world. Nearly 15% of immigrants in Sweden are out of work, compared to 4% of the local born population. Teenagers too have limited options. Underfunded and underperforming schools mean boys often give up on education. Local youth centers have been often taken over by gangs. Bored and lacking direction, teens can wind up joining for the sense of respect and community. None of this is to excuse the violence committed by these young men. The majority of people with immigrant backgrounds in Sweden do not join gangs. They do not murder people, despite suffering the same lack of opportunities. To not acknowledge this would do law-abiding newcomers a disservice. Still, these factors may at least explain why these communities are such fertile ground for gang recruiters. Speaking to The Independent, Dahm and Salihu summed up his thoughts on the issue of immigration and gang crime in the country thusly. Both the Conservatives and the Social Democrats who have governed Sweden for decades have been passive bystanders to an ever-evolving problem of segregation and lack of integration. Maybe it's not the migration, but the lack of planning for a new society that is the culprit. Whatever the truth, that a problem exists today is undoubtable. The only question is, can anybody solve it? Now, as we're working on this piece, we didn't receive some unexpected good news. Gang leader Rao Majid, known as the Kurdish Fox, was arrested crossing the border from Turkey into Iran. As a resident of Turkey, Majid had spent years directing criminal activity and murders in Sweden from abroad. To say his arrest is a relief is probably something of an understatement. A war between Majid's Foxtrot gang and another has helped fuel 2023's surge in violence. Nonetheless, it's hard to believe, given everything we've outlined in this video, that the arrest of one gang boss will bring Sweden back to stability. No. Of course not. Like I said before, it's going to be a power struggle. You, you, it's like Hydra from Marvel. You, you, you arrest or want take one person off the streets. Two will pop up, and those two will war together, and it'll split more people in half and become just a snowball effect. To change the nation's trajectory is going to require much deeper fixes. Thankfully, the ruling coalition already has some ideas. The only problem is, no one is sure if they're going to work. One of the basic steps the current government is taking is to try and make the criminal justice system tougher. That means stuff like increased sentences for gang crimes, tighter parole conditions, and doubling. Yeah, good luck, man. Even if, the, even if, even if that happens, Sweden got some of the most nice. <laughs> They got some of the most nice jails that I've ever come across. Bro, they be having whole cribs, fireplaces, you know what I'm saying? Toilets with bodets in them. Convenience stores in that one. Like, oh, the minimum penalty for gun crimes. It also means the creation of new youth prisons. As we mentioned earlier, a 16-year-old murderer in Sweden will currently serve less than four years in a youth care home for his crime, and with the new bill, 15 to 17-year-olds who commit a serious crime will be sent to something closer to an actual prison, with the first one slated to open in 2026. While well, they won't solve the problem. 
I can't wait for the documentary. Closer to an actual prison, with the first one slated to open in 2026. While they won't solve the problem of the high age of criminal responsibility, it will at least hopefully create some deterrence. At the same time, the number. Because right now, there's no deterrent. Four years, and I'm gonna go. Like, that be the attitude. Like, somebody make you mad, four years, I'm gonna go take that. I ain't doing nothing anyway. I don't even like going to school. My parents are arguing, I'm out of here. <laughs> Watch this. And then on top of that, they're going for four years to somewhere that's probably better than their home situation. That's number of prison places for criminals over 18 will be doubled. For victims of teenage gangsters, Go back. criminal responsibility, it will at least hopefully create some deterrence. At the same time, the number of prison places for criminals over 18 will be doubled. For victims of teenage gangsters, this step will undoubtedly offer comfort. But it's not totally clear whether it's going to work to lower crime rates. Prof Wait, what did you just say? Over 18 will be doubled. For victims of teenage gangsters, for victims of teenage gangsters, this step will undoubtedly offer comfort. If you already a victim, ain't no comfort in my vic in the victimization. I'm already a victim. I could be a DEAD victim. How am I comforted? But it's not totally clear whether it's going to work to lower crime rates. Professor in Criminology and Department Head at Stockholm University, Felipe Estrada, did a long interview with his faculty's website, where he cautioned that Sweden's narcotics market is so lucrative that gangs will likely have little trouble finding new recruits to replace those imprisoned. He also expressed reservations about another tool police will be given, the power of stop and search. Stop and search is a measure whereby police can create a temporary zone inside of which anyone can be searched without the officers needing to prove they suspect them of a- Bro, it's crazy that Sweden has none of this. Sweden was so nice at one point. They didn't need no rules. Oh, stop and search is already a thing? Crime. Such powers are already used widely in England and Wales, where they're extremely controversial because of the disproportionate way that they target minorities. A practice which some argue increases friction between officers and the communities that they serve. Still, these powers can also lead to the discovery of weapons or serious drugs, thereby hopefully discouraging criminals from carrying either. The final major new tool Sweden is considering is something known locally as Sluta Skujut, which translates as Stop Shooting. However, American audiences are more likely to know it by the name Group Violence Intervention. An American idea. First and foremost, Salute to the crib, this Lakeshore Drive right here. I don't know what time of day you were around here getting this footage. I don't know why it's empty, but you know, continue. Pioneered in inner city, likely to know by the name Group Violence Intervention. An American idea pioneered in inner city neighborhoods in places like Chicago and Boston, GVI subjects known gang members to mandatory call-ins. At these sessions, they are confronted by victims of gang crime and then offered pathways out. If they don't take the exit ramp, they're warned that the police will crack down on them remorselessly. In neighborhoods in Boston and Chicago, GVI led to drops in youth homicide of up to between 37 and 63 percent. Nor is it an idea completely alien to Swedish culture. Things got so bad in the city of Malmo that a pilot program was launched in 2018 and later integrated into regular police work. The results seem to speak for themselves. In 2018, Malmo suffered 12 fatal shootings. By 2020, it was reduced to just three. Although it spiked back up to five in 2022, that was still fewer than in 2018 or 2019. According to Radio Sweden, under the program, quote, the number of shootings and explosions in Malmo has gone down by 40 to 60 percent. However, there was one major caveat. According to the National Council for Crime Prevention, it's not certain GVI was solely responsible for this dip in crime. It could be that other factors were at play. Still, these new programs and police powers, a mixture of progressive and conservative approaches, may be the best chance Sweden has. If anybody wants me to react to anything in the chat, please send the link. Don't tell me a name of something. Send the link. At reducing its stratospheric gang crime rate. We can only pray that they work out. At the end of this video, then, it's hopefully clear that Sweden is an extremely complex place, a place where good intentions and a culture of tolerance have accidentally given rise to a spate of bombings and shootings that leave people feeling unsafe even in their own homes. To be clear, we're not saying the country is some sort of crime-ridden hellhole. The overall crime rate remains about the European average. The US government's Sweden travel advisory notice doesn't even mention gang crime, instead focusing on the threat of terrorism inspired by a recent spate of Quran burnings. If you fly to Stockholm tomorrow, your experience will almost certainly be calm and enjoyable. Nonetheless, within the context of its own post-war history, the fact remains that Sweden is experiencing a level of gang violence is never seen before, a criminal wave that has left ordinary citizens feeling helpless. Well, 
my advice is if it's so minuscule and small at this moment, I hope y'all take the right steps to nip it in the bud. Because one wrong step and you're going to be looking like you're going to be looking like Chicago in a minute. See, I love you, like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post. I'm gone, man. Appreciate that. Appreciate the bits.